Wexler. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors. Um, I'm going to say, I see it, I need to find a new word, Bob. I know I keep saying this, but you are wonderful. Oh, um, I don't mind. You can keep on with that world. It's, it, it's like validation. Um so don't, don't don't be too concerned about that. That's fine. I, I will say, but it's familiarity for the listeners as well. They know yeah. that they're in the right place because I always introduce you as the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. So Thank we're you. up to episode 154, and the oh, topic of gosh. this one is overcoming child neglect in therapy. Wonderful title, but you know, our three uh, sort of you know point is going to come up soon anniversary we're having an anniversary bob me and you oh, blimey yeah yeah, yeah. i was just thinking something in the yeah. and stages about it we've moved in we'll have moved into a new era won't we well i'm 53 now so i must be in 50, 53 sorry I'm, i want to be 53 i'm 73 because aging isn't i think i don't know if i age disgracefully or not but when i started this point these podcasts i was 70 yeah but if we're looking at the ages and stages and the psychological development that that we go through the ages of three to six is a new phase isn't it it is so we're moving into a new psychological phase of our podcast bob wow that's a good way to look at it now now from about one and a half to three uh one to three is the rapprochement stage which is of course in in English terms rather than French terms, is the separation and individuation phase. Absolutely. We're yeah. now moving into different uh phases. How interesting. It is. Okay, so anyway, it is yeah. say what the title is again. Overcoming child neglect in therapy. Oh gosh. i I it must be me. I do most of these titles, so I must have come up with this one. You did. Now, of course. When we, when I think of this overcoming child, the first, the first thing I said to myself is, do we, can we ever overcome child neglect? Can we ever, can we ever really overcome? You know, can we help our clients? And the answer is yes, we can help our clients overcome. And then what do we need by neglect? And there's different levels of neglect. Um, but you know, the other thing is our childhoods happened so yes. it's that's what i mean can we ever we can help people move on we can help people grieve we can help people make connections we can help people understand that perhaps what they didn't see as neglect was neglect we can help people look at the consequences of a, a, a neglectful history we can do all those things um and i probably have been doing that for uh, many many years as a therapist and of course as a client in therapy um but so much of this podcast um where would you like to start jackie there was so much to it you know what what are we terming as <clears throat> child neglect and like you said there's loads of different forms of of neglect there's emotional there's physical there's do you know what i mean mental the as a an ex foster carer, one of the things that we were taught that neglect always accompanies any other form of, of you know, trauma in one shape or another. When we're talking about, you know, child children. So if there's like physical abuse or anything like that, there will always be neglect connected to that as well. And what is neglect? Is it just not meeting the needs of the child? Are you asking me or saying that to yourself? I'm just I'm asking it out loud. Is is that what we term as neglect, as not meeting the needs of the child, whether that's adequate food, clothing, you know, supervision, medical help if they need it? It's all those things. And I particularly liked what you said about linking it to trauma. And it's all those things. And I sort of said yeah, over to you because it's such a bit 
big podcast. And I think it's a continuum of what we can call neglect. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, you know, I was thinking of as in an extreme end, of course, when people are abandoned, where people are, um, I was just thinking of a story I heard the other day of a baby that was left at the age of sort of six weeks in a, in a um, thoroughfare because obviously the mother wanted the baby to be found because left in such a public place. Yeah. Um, from that type of um, abandonment and, and often you often sometimes the mothers or the significant other people who may abandon the children uh, feel it's for their best. So we have, even though I don't, I don't think it can ever be, but we have, you know, extreme neglect at those levels. But on the other side of it, uh, we can have what we might want to call cumulative neglect. Yeah. Where there's, you know, like a drip, drip, yeah, drip, drip. The the missed times, the neglective transactions, the neglective emotional processes, the um, the continual disowning, the defining of the other without seeing them with the value and importance and emotional recognition. And it happens over and over and over and over again to the father that's never there, the mothers are not there, we can work right up the continuum. Yeah. And when we talk about childhood neglect and cumulative neglect. Yeah, um, 100% agree. And you know, what interests me, I'm not talking about extreme neglect here, is the many clients I've seen over the years would say, well, you know, Bob, no, I was never neglected. And then they tell me about how they came home at uh, quarter past three and had to let themselves in and, yeah. you know, sort of make themselves scarce or look after themselves or watch television or make tea. And then the parents come home at seven o'clock and you ask them what age they are. They say, oh, I don't know, four, five, six. Yeah. And they never think of that as neglect. And they never think about the consequences of how come in relationships they have so much difficulty, not only taking care of, you know, the other person, but uh, have different, they have difficulties in maintaining relationships or have difficulties in the worlds of attachments because they've never really understood what is meant by emotional attachment. <laughs> Yeah, I think this is one of the interesting things with, with, you know, families is we accept certain things as being normal because we don't know how it is in other families until, you know, we get to an age where maybe we're going over to a friend's house or whatever. Do you know what I mean? But as young children, our environment is just normal to us. Mm. So we accept certain things as just being how it is for everybody else. Mm. Mm. And we find relationships quite often as we grow older with the same patterns. Yeah. And we find people who fit into those patterns where the other person may not treat them well, treat you well, or may not see you as important or value you. Yes. Yeah. And you don't quite understand the difference because that's how it's always been or all your life even though you feel so alone in the middle of a very a dance hall or whatever it is yeah yeah it's funny how we can feel lonely in a room full of people sometimes <laughs> yeah yeah very cool with this sort of histories we're talking about yeah and of course here i was just thinking of the you know, we need to also remind ourselves of the counter-transference response of the therapist and the reactive counter-transference of the smart therapist and the histories of the therapists. Yes. Yeah. And if you've had a therapist who's had a neglected history and hasn't done the therapeutic work around that, um, I think there's 
then quite a lot of difficulties for an effective therapy. Yeah. And I, I think whether I'm not sure whether you agree with it or not, I think it's OK for us to be selective in the clients that we work with. If we feel that we're, you know, we're still working on our own personal things, whether that's, you know, we've just been through a divorce and we're not doing couples counselling anymore or, or past trauma, whatever it is, that it's OK to not work with certain clients if we don't feel the capacity is there mm. to help them. Mm. Oh, I, I I definitely agree with that. From an, from many stances, but also from an ethical stance. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And you know, I was just thinking about what we're talking about here, and I just want to repeat myself here for the sake of this podcast, I suppose again, which is most of the clients I see, I think, again, and I've said this before, are very loyal to their parents. Mm. So when we start talking about neglect, whether it's on the the the, the, the different levels of continuum, the the response which often will come back, which is something like, "Well, my parents never knew any difference," or oh, "I was different in that generation." Yeah, that's something I hear a lot. That's just how it was then. Yeah. That's just how it was, you know. Or oh, my parents were very very busy then. Or they didn't have much money or we could have a huge variation and that may or may not be true. And it doesn't take away the neglect that a child might feel yeah, or the consequences which are set up psychologically from that pattern. Yeah. And I know, I'm sure we've had this conversation before about, you know, trauma and what, what needs to happen for trauma to occur? And you 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 mentioned this at the beginning, that drip, drip, drip effect. Mm. You know, we, we don't need to go through a massive trauma to be affected by something. It can just be that ongoing drip, drip, drip effect, mm. you know, that, that impacts us long term. Mm. So you might have a narcissistic parent or significant other or um the, sees themselves at the center of the world for whatever reasons. Yeah. And what will happen with the child usually is they are defined by the parent, you know, um, and that can be experienced as very neglectful. Yeah. Now, some people listening to this podcast might see that as perhaps not neglect. I do. I think I think if you passing over messages you're not important or you're not valuable or you're not worthwhile. Yeah. Or you know, I'm coming home at ten o'clock because I've been out in the pub. Uh, I like drink or what what whatever, then the child will often feel not met, not attuned to, not emotionally attuned to. And often feel neglected yeah and it, it's it's the decisions that we make about the behavior of our main caregiver and how we interpret that that we mm. then internalize and take with us mm. you know i'm thinking now the amount of time i was walking i go for a walk every day around i've got a lake near me so i go for a walk every day and th there was a, a woman a mum sat on a bench on a phone looking at a phone the mm. dog was trying to get her attention with its ball and she had a little toddler there that was crying and trying to get her attention and she was just sitting oblivious on a phone on a park bench wow. and I can remember when I was walking past thinking I'm sure this lady was doing this walk because she thought it would be beneficial to the dog and her child but mm. what she's doing now is not beneficial to either one of them. She wasn't emotionally available to that child. She wasn't paying any attention to that child. It was obviously trying to get her attention and she was rightly or wrongly oblivious to it. That's right. And I just thought of the, uh, I think it was in the last podcast where we talked about generational scripts. Yeah. And often what is, you know, these patterns we're talking about here are often patterns passed down yeah 
I think mobile phones have got a lot to answer to as far as relations within the family. Well, that's the whole story, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mobile phones and social media and what we're talking about here. I was also thinking how, how many stories I hear around, um, I just, one of my favourite programmes is The Traitor, as you probably, Traitors, I mean, it's some time along ago now, um, the UK one. But in that one, one of the um, people who I think came third, I might, was talking about at the age of 11, how he found out that his dad had a completely different family. Wow. Bigamy, in other words, I'm talking about, where there's two yeah. families and had done for some time. Now, how does a child make sense of that? Yeah, how do they? The whole life, the re whole reality is... Well, I was just thinking, if we're talking about neglect, Yeah. if the, the person's got another family, what happens then is that the person, I'm not sure this person went down this road, I don't know, but I'm just talking about... Actually, I was thinking about the clients here. They will start remembering how much they've missed yeah the person uh, and it and it, it reminded me of another film i saw recently where um a very powerful film and the um person was uh, a pilot and he was uh the plane blew up basically for lots of different reasons i, I, won't, I won't destroy the plot but it, it it, the result of it was is the family, the wife and the daughter, uh, found out that actually their husband or the father had another life as well, in another place, and had had for ten years. Wow! And then they start thinking about well, the times they've missed or what could yeah. have been, and how it should have been, all those different things, and. We then have another story completely, don't we? Later yeah. in life, I was thinking. Yes, yeah. And, and what decisions you, know, you might make. I think you, you've said it a couple of times in this about neglect being on a continuum as well. I quite <laughs> like that. Mm, always on That's, an ad with trauma. Yes, yeah. Yeah, because I, when I was doing my foster care training, we had to do a lot, an awful lot of training and do it you know, continuously every year, quite rightly. And one of the things that they did talk about this continuum of, of neglect and abuse, you know, and neglect can be seen as not dressing the child appropriately for the weather. Yeah. Versus, do you know what I mean? Leaving a yeah. four-year-old at home on their own overnight. Mm -hmm. there's, there's completely different things. And each one will impact on the child in completely different ways. And they may not experience X as neglect because they don't know any difference. Yeah. I can remember one of our foster children was, I don't think it was attachment. It was just one, he always expected us to, to abandon him. So, you know, I, this particular day, it was at a, a summer school and I'd gone to pick him up and he was so relieved to see me as if there'd been times where they hadn't picked him up or they'd been late or he'd just been forgotten about or whatever it was. He would always insist in getting a, a, a definite time that I would be there. Mm. Just confirmation that you are going to come back and pick me up type of thing. Mm. And these and how all this impacts the child. And of course, we're dealing with the clients and they're in a child, of course. Yeah. How that then gets played out in attachments and in relationships, and then they have their own children or not. Yeah. Um, usually, often it's a replication of their script or their yeah. history. Yeah. Because if we think of the major tenant of psychotherapy, that the past affects the present, and the decisions that we make about other people and the world then formulates how we play out our own world. Yeah. Then generational scripts and generational histories gets played out and that's often why clients come because they start realizing they're repeating histories and then we start tracking things back and helping them make connections 
and then they start putting two and two together and realize how they are in a relationship and the people that they picked is so determined on the decisions they made and what happened to them all those years ago yeah this is what we're talking about in front of us here yeah i always find it fascinating that you know individually we react and respond in often completely different ways you know in, in my head somebody who's experienced neglect in childhood can kind of be you know find it really difficult to make attachments to people mm. they're always planning for it not to last or whatever it is or they can be completely codependent on somebody so the responses and reactions can be completely different even though they've kind of gone through a similar experience mm. absolutely I find that fascinating. There isn't one definite way that everybody's going to respond or react to certain, you know, periods of neglect in their life. It's all unique. And with cumulative neglect, cumulative, someone's had it, whether they are aware of it or not. Yeah. The defense systems against feeling the neglect or the trauma we want to talk about will be to dissociate, to cut off, yeah, to deny, to depersonalize, and to move away, to defend against feeling the aloneness or the misery or however we want to look at it, of the consequences of abandonment or neglect, whatever words we used. These defenses are all quite similar. Yeah. And usually they are a disavowal of the self. In other words, we cut off part of ourself. We move away because we don't want to feel those feelings that go with neglect or yeah. abandonment. So we put them all off into a compartment. But you're right, they go with trauma. Yeah, yeah. And we can get on in life and not have to feel any of these things. Yeah. Now, it's not until later in life where those compartments get a bit creaky in terms of the doors and they get opened up a bit, usually by triggers in the present when uh, similar things happen, which reminded the person of the past, that we need different coping mechanisms. Yeah, the old ones aren't working quite as well as what they used to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, it's it's a it's a job you you and I have done for many years is to help the person unpick the feelings that go underneath the neglected child. Yeah. So until they can start doing that, they aren't really or probably find it challenging to make connections about how it was then and how it can be different today yeah and to, you know to, to get that trust and that relationship with somebody that has experienced neglect in their life is again it's a long-term process it's not going to be built up overnight and you know one of the things that I think people would come to therapy with is replaying similar behaviors in different relationships and self-sabotage like you were saying about, you know what I mean? I'm going to end it before they leave me type of thing, or I'm going to hurt them before they hurt me. Oh, no one will ever know me because yes. if they ever know me, if they really ever know me. Yeah. Then they'll leave me. Yeah. Or oh, variations on that theme. Yeah. As a therapist, we have to go back. We have to help them explore their inner child. We have to help them explore the experience of neglection, help them understand and understand comment of grief and how we can then go forward and help them heal so they take can take back parts of themselves so they can be different in life. That's a whole healing experience entailing grief and trauma. Yeah. 
absolutely i think one of the things that kind of became apparent to me with one particular client that I, I i know you know through working with them that they did have you know lots of neglect in their life was that i needed to take things really really slowly and not be too emotional with them or expect them to have many feelings, if that makes sense. There was a lots of logical things with them to make that emotional connection with them took an awful lot of time. Oh. It it was, yeah, it was a slow process. Yeah, I know. I think a job you had, uh, I don't know if you still do much of it, which is fostering, is an incredible job. And it's one which... I'm sure you got a lot from else you wouldn't have done it. And maybe also needs to come with a health warning. Yeah, absolutely. Because a lot of the, I don't, I can't speak for your experiences, but I do know that the type of, you know, I think of adoption and fostering and that type of, the types of kids that we, that, you know, adopted, you know, we adopt or we foster are by definition, going to have a lot of trauma yeah and then how does the foster parent and the adopted parent then deal with that without at least some psychoeducation it must be very difficult you need to be very resilient i think do you know what i mean and not take things personally and that was the bit i struggled with in the early days was taking it personally you know the fact that, that i my own background, you know what I mean? I'm a people pleaser and I want to be liked and everything. And they didn't like me. And I needed to, you, to learn think, that that was okay. I don't know if you got this. So uh, again, you can tell me. Do you think that psychoeducation of the foster parent or the adopted, in you know, the adopted, in other words, they can understand, so that the person can understand that the damaged, traumatized children are bound to enact out their history with you would do, if they, you know would that type of information really help absolutely yeah did you get that on a surface level i think but i think a lot of social services are just trying to protect themselves against allegations so mm. it was more the practicalities of keeping diaries and making sure that you're meeting all the criteria of the basic needs of the child rather than the psychological impact on you or them. I, I understand. And I was thinking about when you said about taking things personally. Yeah. It really, you know, understood that or people in your position really understood that process. I've just talked about that they're bound to enact out the histories with you might help you protect yourself and ground yourself in the process uh -huh. now i think psychotherapists you know when when clients come into their room and talk about oh well, we'll start off something like you know i um have attachment problems or i have relationship problems or i don't take care of myself or many of these different things often around attachment theory yeah. and as you start to go back you start to hear of the um trauma and the attachment trauma and you know there's different continuums like we talked about here i think the therapists need to really understand that those clients will enact their histories yeah. with you and if the therapist takes it personally effective therapy is not going to happen yeah absolutely yeah and like I said, I know I say this probably on every bloody episode, but it is like the matrix, all of this stuff. Everything's intertwined and everything. I think if as psychotherapists we go into it thinking that we're always going to have an amazing relationship with every single client and that we're not going to have negative thoughts and feelings around what's going on, I think we're you know eluding ourselves or whatever. We're in cloud cuckoo land. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> without a without a, a means of escape. Yeah, yeah. Abs yeah. I, you know, I think we must have done so. I don't know how many Christmases we've had, but I do remember in a podcast Christmas special we had, 
and I was talking about different types of therapists and I was talking about a therapist, the therapist that deal with Christmas. And I remember one therapist that I supervised who said they, oh, I'll put a Christmas tree up and I'll make sure we would have merry music and we had mince pies. And it all came from a very, um, uh, a place of the therapist who had such a wonderful positive Christmases that they wanted to make the their clients have positive Merry Christmases. Yeah. And everything went up ship creek because I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, not only couldn't that could not happen. We couldn't we experience make those positive experience of our own be the ex suddenly positive experience of our clients and it always should be because the therapist didn't realize that their clients had completely different experiences and the first step is to is to honor and attune to the experiences of the clients to help uh effective psychotherapy happen and those stories and you can't suddenly in fact it's the worst type of therapy yeah my book even though it came from a good place absolutely and it, i think it always does come from a good place in a therapy situation but you know people's experiences of neglect or or family life or whatever can be so different different and extreme to the ones that we're used to you know i've had clients that have felt uncomfortable with the back to a door you know, where, yes. where the, the position of the chair is, something that I would never even have thought about. Mm -hmm. But things like that, you know, so certain clients, I, I used to shift the chairs into a different position, you know, and, and when really? they first come, it's not something that they want to divulge. No. Why they feel. No, I understand that, that feel. completely because that's my experience for lots I, of different yeah. reasons. But for many therapists who haven't had those experiences, they find it hard to understand and it, I, this isn't about critique of therapists but this is just to say that people that there is character transference yeah and i think therapists who perhaps haven't got those understandings doesn't mean they can't have good good and effective therapy but i think they need to just understand differences and help the client get to what was so difficult for them rather than the therapist trying to make it right in the yes. here and now. Yes. Because yeah. Because if they do that, they'll the client will go underground. There'll be no, no real achievement and effective psychotherapy won't happen. Yeah. On the other side, you can have therapists, of course, who had tremendous loss, tremendous neglect. And then of course we might have what is called reactive countertransference, where the therapist reacts to the loss because that's their history in some ways and they start doing cognitive psychotherapy because they don't want to go near the feelings yeah and then again the, 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 they miss the client yeah so maybe your analogy of a matrix and all the different tunnels and all the different layers and all the different things that you're talking about perhaps is a pretty good analogy yeah, absolutely. We need our supervision. You people listening out there, supervision, therapy, supervision, yeah. all these different things. They're so important resources for therapists to use. Yeah, because we are constantly working through our own stuff. And whether we like it or not, and however long I believe we've been therapists, we will be triggered from time to time listening to other people's experiences. Oh. I don't think I would be human if I hadn't been triggered numerous no. times in the therapy room. And we need, and you are right. And uh, I think most therapists listening to the, these podcasts realize that. And that's when they need to go to supervision. Yeah. And use supervision effectively. Um, it's a, it, it's a, it's a challenging profession in these ways that we're talking about. And most them, most people have experienced loss to certain degrees. Yes, yeah. On the continuum. And so yeah. most steps will have some transferential processes going on and some much more extreme than others. Yeah. 
I love the fact that we're all unique. I love the fact that we all process things in completely different ways, that there isn't a one size fits all. The, and I the, love the fact that my clients keep me on my toes as well. I like that in my job. I think there is a sort of truism, and that is that I know there's a difference. I've been saying this in podcasts and different ends of the continuum of grief and loss. So let's just take that as read. But I think the defense against loss and grief is what I said, is to move away from the self. Yeah. Yeah. And the therapist's job is to track that move. Yeah. Help them understand that those very defense systems, which were so important at that time in terms of survival, might not help them now in terms of where they want to go. Yeah. So it's finding a new way. Finding a new way and having lots of tissues. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Seriously. Because Valid we're point. About trauma. We're, yeah. we're Real healing. Yeah. Real healing. Yeah. So, Bob, until next time, where we will be talking about what's love got to do with it within the therapy process. Well, that, <laughs> I'm, that's a, that's another big uh, title. I think, I often think, because I, I, I do most of these titles, you do all the titles, think, Bob. Yeah, I think after where do I come from? And of course, that's an interesting podcast we talk talk about, which is like, you know, what is the parameters that that, 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 that impacts me when I'm thinking these titles? But certainly, what love is, you know, the whole subject of love, nurture, and the therapeutic process is a really important one to discuss. You've been listening to the Therapy Show. Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.